So good morning. We are going to begin the last table, round table of this conference. Welcome. And I would like first to thank the organizer, organizers to invite me to moderate this uh, table, which will focus on the patient citizens' organizations view, that is how patients' organizations articulate patient involvement in HTA and the successful factors, barriers, challenge that um, they have and opportunities of this involvement. To talk about that, we have invited four speakers who are rep representatives of different patients associations or organizations. We are going to have François Oyer from Rare Disease Europe, Eurodris, Nicolas Brook from Patient Focused Medicines Development, Tamás Varexi, who is here as well, from the European Patient Academy, EUPATI, and also Isabel Amo, it's here, okay, nice to meet you from the Spanish Patients Forum. Now we have the first two speakers, because we don't have enough space. And after their presentations, we will have time for discussion, for questions, and we will call the next ones to, to, to come here and, and present uh, their uh, presentations. So they will have 20 minutes, more or less, and uh, we will keep uh, questions to, to the end. So, well, first of all, let me begin uh, uh, by briefly introducing the subjects and questions uh, for the speakers. Um, as you know, the incorporation of patients into HTA is a growing tendency on an international level, as we have uh, uh, heard in the, in the last uh, table. HTA agencies are making increasing efforts not only to incorporate patients, but to ensure that their participation is meaningful, that is uh, allowing patients to contribute to HTA decisions, but also that is maximizing their scientific contributions to the evaluation. Another aspect uh, is that the research carried out in the framework of uh, the Spanish HTA network have shown a panorama in which the participation of patients can contribute to improve the products at each, at each stage of the evaluation process. So creating more relevant and fair and equitable products through democratic, legitimate and scientific sound processes. Finally, the lit literature provides increasing evidence of contribution of patient participation in the HTA process, and these contributions go beyond making the evaluation procedure and have policies more democratic since the participation of patients brings scientific quality to the HTA product, or this uh, we think that would bring this scientific quality by making uh, available their experience, uh, values and preferences. And we would like precisely, uh, uh, because we really think that uh, their involvement could bring this more scientific quality, uh, we, we have invited people who have uh, uh, with their organization have been working in this, in this kind of involvement and we would like to uh, ask them when, who, how effective it's, uh, it is this involvement, which is uh, in their experience the main outcome of this collaboration in each input point, where the added value brought by patients involvement res resides, also which are the successful factors of this engagement barriers that uh, they, they face, challenge, and new opportunities as well. And finally, which improvements could uh, uh, good uh, they like to see in order to make uh, this collaboration more effective. So thank you for being here. Um, I am Mireia Espallargues from the Catalan Agency for Quality and um, Assessment in, in, in Barcelona. We, we have invited in some of our uh, studies the, the participation, the involvement of patients, caregivers, etc. Uh, when we thought it was important uh, having them in, in our studies. And more recently, uh, Aquas, 
who uh, core uh, business is HCA also have been expanding to other areas and has recently created a specific area to, to precisely um, try to define a strategic uh, um, line for the patient center uh, involvement in, in all our activities. So we we think that um, uh, we will uh, improve and we will uh, go forward in, in, in this uh, in this area. So uh, first of all, um, uh, now it's time for the uh, presentation of, of the speakers. We will have Francois Oyer. Um, he is from Eurodis, the voice of rare disease patients. Uh, Francois is working at the European Organization for Rare Diseases since 2003. He represents Eurodis at the Euro European Medicines uh, Agency in UNETA and in the HDA network. He's responsible for patient engagement in HDA activities at the European uh, uh, level. Uh, in your case, we are very interested in, in your experience in the EMA, so uh, where uh, patients have been actively interacting uh, since the creation of the agency in 1995. Uh, that is how participation, how patient participation is articulated in, in the EMA. So thank you, Francois. Thank you very much for, for the invitation. And often when we discuss about the HTA in, in Spain, in different European discussions, we hear sentences like, well, how do they do it in Spain? How can they uh, avoid uh, duplication? Why do they need really 11 agencies? So really, thank you for the invitation, because I think now I have a much better understanding on how it, it works, and it is extremely important to, to, to have that, that understanding, else we, we may have misconceptions and misperceptions. So I will focus, I will say a few words on how patients are engaged with the European Medicines Agency, and now, and how, how it happened. And first, mentioning the, an important initiative that we, the patient and consumers organizations, took uh, a few years ago, which shows the responsibilities we feel we, we, we have engaging patients. We need to make sure that trust is there. We need to make sure that patients who discuss with the regulators have highest possible credibility. And this is why we came with this code of practices that explains to our members, to the patients, uh, the practices which they need to put in place themselves uh, to uh, reach the table of discussion, to reach the, the decision making. For example, patients not necessarily measure the consequences of being quoted in a press release of a pharmaceutical company when the company launches uh, clinical trials. And recently we had an example of one patient who was quoted, meaning this person had a unique opportunity to discuss the trial with the company at a very early stage. And then other patient organizations a few years later were advocating for compassionate use. And they were blaming the first patient not to have taken this opportunity to discuss with the company to anticipate a possible compassionate use. So there are consequences, even in things so simple as being quoted in a press release, which have consequences, sometimes unexpected, that we, we need to, to have in mind. We are not maybe using this code of practices as much as we could, but really, and you can uh, uh, read the document uh, with a link, I think this is something we need to advertise more to all patient organizations for uh, to educate them to the consequences of um, some, some actions. Above all, the European Treaty highlights the importance of transparency in, uh, of the decision making at all levels. And I think the EMA is uh, an illustration of this absolute requirement. If you want the European citizens to adhere to the decision they make, you need to ensure the highest level of transparency. The public needs to understand how the decisions are made. The public needs to witness how experts are evaluating medicines. 
else there may be misperception. For example, if a medicine is authorized in the US but not in the EU, and in the EU we don't know on which grounds this decision was made, then we have a problem and the EMA may have difficulties justifying and explaining its, uh, its role. So it started in 95 when the EMA was created and immediately uh, uh, some patient groups, and one in particular, the European AIDS Treatment Group, asked to meet with the experts and that happened in April 96 and I will explain you a few words about it. And then there were anecdotal uh, meetings between some patient organizations and some uh, experts at the EMA, but it's really only in 2002 uh, when the EMA decided that they should uh, organize a framework uh, to ensure that all patients they need to work with uh, could have a structure to interact with the EMA. It took four years uh, to establish this framework, so now it's in place since 2006. And last year in 2016, on 770 occasions, patients participated in activities at the European Agency. So we moved from a situation where 12 member states were making decisions independently from each other to a situation now where we have 28 and soon 27, plus Norway, Iceland and Liechtenstein with well, serving 508 million citizens, meaning that a product has the same name, the same information in all 28 uh, countries and all documents, the package leaflet, the IPAR summaries uh, are reviewed, all documents which are intended for the public are reviewed by patients and, and consumers. When to consult with patients and I think it's maybe the most important slide I, I have. Uh, at the very beginning, even the preclinical stage of uh, product development, there are already discussions with the developers in different settings. Some are called community advisory boards, where these are discussed. It's not systematic, but it happens. And this is, for example, where mixed method research can be used to help the developer uh, learn what really matters to the patients. If you have a disease, for example, a rare metabolic disease which can affect both the vision or the kidney, some patients uh, will uh, want to have less, fewer dialysis and other patients want to have their vision improve. But how do you measure that you improve the vision? How do you know if patients would like to have uh, if one dialysis a week is, is okay or not. These techniques are important to decide how you will measure uh, the impact of the medicine in the life of the patient, the patient relevant outcomes, and this has to be preclinical. You have to decide this before you even start uh, the uh, development of medicine. And then there is the development itself. So now we have scientific advice where the regulators, the patient, and the developers can discuss together uh, how to improve the clinical trial, which design to, to choose, which population to include, which comparator to use, etc. And now we, we have also the HTA early dialogues. And it continues uh, by the time the product is ready for evaluation. We have now set up the different tools which can help uh, the decision makers to consult with patients uh, on the benefit risk uh, evaluation itself and it continues after the marketing authorization uh, with the work of uh, with uh, HTA. So if you see it from the patient perspective we want to be involved in all these steps to do all these activities and in a way uh, the separation, the distinction between regulators, HTA developers is artificial from the patient perspective, it's an adventure from discussing how the product will be evaluated to uh, the end evaluation and evidence generation. There is a continuum. But we have difficulties here because when you talk with a developer, then it reduces your ability to be consulted by regulators and HD experts. So I think we, we need to find ways to ensure trust and credibility and learn uh, how patients can in fact advise whoever needs and wants to be advised all along the, the life cycle of the product development. And we can add horizon scanning. Uh, this is something that is not uh, often used, but as patient organizations, in fact, sometimes are reviewing all products in the pipeline, 
if you interview them, if you ask them, of all these products, which of one of them do you think are the most promising, the most interesting to you, then it gives you some elements of reflection for the horizon scanning. So do we have the, the right outcome measurement tools? Uh, patients participate, and that's one of the activities in guideline de development. And this is the, that was the objective of the first meeting in April, April 96, uh, when AIDS groups discussed with the CPMP how to replace the mortality uh, criteria and the new AIDS cases with surrogate markers, and the patients who visited who came to talk with the CPMP had collected information from different scientific conferences and they came with the evidence. They came with the evidence that uh, HIV RNA and uh, CD4 T cells were surrogate uh, endpoints or could be used as surrogate uh, endpoints. Uh, the EMA organized the workshop a few a month later to have a consensus and they changed their evaluation criteria with an immediate consequence that the, the duration of the clinical trials could be reduced from three to four years to 24 weeks to six months following a dialogue, a scientific dialogue with patient organizations. And this is when the, the CHMP called CPMP at that time said, okay, we have a problem. If all patient organizations have so relevant information to share with us and there are so many products and so many diseases for which we need to have this dialogue, how are we going to, to do it? More recently, the network of Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy proposed to the EMA a, a similar workshop to discuss uh, the evaluation of products to treat Duchenne uh, disease. So there were an, an update of the guidelines in 2011 they're still working on it because it's extremely difficult to select the right, the most relevant uh, measurement tool. And uh, end of last year, for spinal muscular atrophy, again, driven by the patients and the clinicians who proposed to the EMA to organize a scientific workshop to discuss how to evaluate uh, the medicines uh, for this disease. Unfortunately, HTA experts are not invited to these meetings, but I think that should change because it's extremely useful for, for all, uh, all parties. In the network, uh, in this framework, uh, we've been working with the EMA in the patients and consumers working party to build this framework with all the rules, all the guidelines uh, that are needed from this uh, framework to, to be articulated and to, to work. For example, there are guidance adopted by the management board uh, explaining the role of patients in the scientific committees or a pilot phase where now patients are invited by the CHMP when there is an oral explanation with the developer, and you will see some results of this pilot phase. For the reporting, uh, every year there is an, uh, a report to the management board on all activities where <laughs> patients are involved in the activities of the EMA. We define together the rules, eligibility criteria, how to define a patient organization, a consumer organization, which criteria should they fulfill in order to be eligible to work with the EMA? What about the evaluation of the financial information or, or sources of, uh, of funding? How to ensure transparency and our funding? All this is detailed in all the documents uh, that you can read on this website of the, of the EMA and also a training strategy with face-to-face -face meetings, videos, and uh, specific workshops that the EMA has put in place following discussions with, uh, with us. We also celebrated our 10th anniversary uh, last, uh, last year. So all these efforts to have this kind of uh, British-made uh, cake, I'm not sure that was worth it, but in fact, <laughs> The cake wasn't that bad, and so you, you have a picture of uh, members of the PCWP. It's a strange animal because it's not only patients and consumers, but we have representatives of all scientific committees joining together, discussing uh, all what the EMA is doing and how patients can participate and how we can improve this uh, quality of, uh, of dialogue and, and interaction. Just a few examples that come from the report of the, of the EMA. 
Here you have the scientific advice and protocol assistance procedures where in 2016, 82 patients were invited to, to the discussions. Scientific advisory group, this is more uh, when the uh, benefit risk is evaluated, where last year, uh, 28 patients were invited to discuss with experts about the uh, benefit risk of medicines. And committee consultations, this is for example where the, when the pharmacovigilance committee wants to consult with uh, women who were exposed to Valproate about the uh, efficacy of their risk communication, they can consult uh, the public, the patient organizations, and there were 32 last year, and in the report you have all this evolution. Here you see a huge increase for the scientific advice that is explained by two things. First, the EMA and patient organizations recruited additional staff to help identify patients who would participate to the meetings. And the chair of the scientific advice now are always asking for patients uh, to their meetings. They understand so much, they appreciate so much the value of having patients in their discussions that now they are systematically asking uh, for patients to participate. But to make it happen, it's not easy. It doesn't happen in just one day. These are all the steps. First, you need to identify, you need to find patients. And in all of this, I am helped with a retired policeman. He told me, you know, I'm very good at finding people who don't want to be, uh, to be found, so I will help you to find the, the patients uh, you need for these processes, procedures. We need to prepare patients. We need to explain them. Many don't even know what the EMA is. Sometimes they are confused. They think it's a company inviting them to, to London. So you have to explain them the, the basics so that they feel comfortable and they know what their role will be in the meeting. Then uh, to accompany them to, to the meeting, to evaluate their input and to acknowledge their, their input. And all this is taking time and resources and has to be organized. For Aurordis, this is what it means. We have seven books, seven for volunteers. seven of our volunteers uh, who are members of scientific committees, the committee that designates our five medicinal products, the pediatric committee, the committee for advanced therapies and the patients and consumer working party. And you see that in average, they spend 41 days a year in these activities. A volunteer spending 41 days a year when you have 20 days holidays, uh, it's not easy to organize. It's not easy to find volunteers who commit to, to this work. We have uh, staff, three different staff, 1.5 full-time equivalent in total to uh, help this engagement. We have also one staff member who is member of the EMA management board. This is the total of uh, scientific advice procedures and the EMA sends us all of them which are for uh, orphan products. We review all of them and we advise this, uh, the EMA telling them, for this one, we need, you need a patient because there are these aspects that need to be discussed. And so last year, there were 76 patients invited in total to scientific advice, of whom 25 were from Eurodis for orphan medicinal products. We need to train patients. So we have a program called Summer School uh, where uh, more than 300 patients with rare diseases were trained on regulatory and HTA affairs, plus all the tools that we need to create and maintain, uh, just our contact database. We have 1,900 1, rare disease organizations in our database. We think we cover 4,000 of the 7,000 rare diseases, and we use it daily to contact organizations when we need to to identify patients for a procedure here or a procedure there. Part of the training is, uh, for example, that case that we discuss uh, at our summer school, how not to be influenced by pharmaceutical industry. It's not even talking about the financial interest, but this is one case, a real case that happened when the CHMP invited two, part, two patients to an oral explanation, and two hours before the meeting, the patients went to meet their clinicians and the representative of the company in a hotel. The company wanted to make sure the patients would say the right thing to, to the CHMP. Of course, this should not happen this way because this is not establishing trust between the EMA and the patients. 
So we explain to the patients the possible consequences of them attending the, the meeting. I had to report the incident to the CHMP. So the CHMP explained the situation, the, the chair explained the situation to um, all the CHMP members before it started. But it is a case that is important to explain to patient organizations things that absolutely need to be avoided to uh, build this trust. And there are other cases, not that many, but there are other cases which need to be shared to improve the, the situation. But how do we involve patients? What are the best procedures to involve patients? To consult one or two patients in a meeting? To ask the opinion of one expert or to the organization? Uh, how to use patient preference elicitations, which is a new technique to interview a certain number of patients to see how they weigh the benefit and, and risk, but how, how long does it take and can it be used in the timelines of a regulatory process? What about other deliberative methods, panel of patients, citizens, juries, focus groups? There are experiences, but I don't have the time to explain uh, 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 them all. Uh, but experiences that are worth uh, sharing. Face to face, by video conference, in writing, should we invite patients who participated in clinical trials or on the contrary, who are completely naive about the product and the uh, clinical development? These are still open questions that the EMA should uh, pilot. The success factors, to finish uh, this presentation, and I first would like to quote Jean-Michel Alexandre, who was the first chair of the CHMP when the EMA was created, who said that with a high quality dialogue, patients and regulators can only agree. I'm quite sure this would apply also to HTA. If we manage to establish the right high quality dialogue between HTA doers and patients, we can only agree on the relative effectiveness of these health technologies. But we have to establish this dialogue first. And what is really important at the EMA is that it's true that we patients consider we, are take, we have the same credibility as other experts. The EMA has proven it on many occasions. There is a dedicated unit at the EMA with the staff and all resources needed, including the training materials. They have a budget and resources for the stakeholders' involvement. Uh, they have special arrangements uh, for volunteers who are not staff of a patient organizations. And we have clear rules for involvement that we define, that we work together with the EMA, which are revised as often as, uh, as needed. Just one example, the pilot, the CHMP, inviting patients at the oral explanation. All the activities are evaluated. There is always a questionnaire to the participants or to the EMA uh, experts. And here, for example, the, the 14 patients who participated to the six first CHMP meeting, uh, almost all of them said they were given enough and adequate information uh, before the meeting uh, to provide input to the discussion. And uh, many said their comments were taken into account during the discussion. And this art. Uh, basic questions which are asked systematically to all patients who participate in one of the many activities at the, at the EMA. Among barriers and obstacles, we are not that many. Uh, there are few patients who are willing to give their time and expertise to uh, national or European uh, scientific authorities, even if there are efforts to train more and to provide uh, uh, support on, uh, on internet, we are still too few. The time commitment, and even more when this time is uh, not paid. Uh, the conflict of interest and also the confidentiality, which are often a problem where patients have to make decisions they are forced to make. Should we advise the developer to help selecting the best outcome measurement tool, or should we advise the regulators when the results will be available, but it's one or the other, uh, it can't be both. And we, we are few, and we have to divide uh, the few people we have. One, some will do this, but others will, will do that, and it's limiting. The regulatory timelines, which are as fast as the HTA ones, the fact that younger patients now tend to uh, work together, to join together on social networks, ignoring the classic patient 
organizations with the registered statutes and uh, it is changing uh, the kind of interaction that patients may have with uh, institutions and the absence of impact assessment when the European legislators um, decide that patients uh, play a role in the decision making. Here I have listed all the regulations where patients are invited to, for example, sit in scientific committees. In all these legislations, there is an impact assessment where they evaluate the cost for national competent authorities, the cost and the resources needed for the EMA to host a certain number of members uh, in a committee. They never ask the question in terms of civil society engagement. Uh, what would be the impact and the resources needed to make sure that these databases are constructed and maintained, these training programs are in place, that these monitoring uh, activities are also in place. This never happens and this has to change because uh, th th this is really limiting the ability of patients to, to participate. So regarding the EMA, uh, the next uh, steps uh, will be soon in September the 1st public hearing on pharmacovigilance and this is something that all of the Europe will be looking at, uh, um, observing how these public hearings will, uh, will be organized. Uh, we will update the patient information, the patient leaflet, and you will see an example using graphic visualization so that patients may understand better the information on benefit risk. Uh, there are other IMI projects in progress to generate patient preferences elicitations. We don't know yet how the regulators will use them or the HTA will use them, but they, they will come very soon this year. We have prime priority medicines with very, very early scientific advice even before the first clinical trials have started. And I, we hope that more HT experts will also attend this, uh, these meetings. We would like to create a new status for patients, exactly like clinical investigators who advise uh, the developers of medicines. We would like to, to, to develop the status of patient investigators those who are well trained and who are well knowledgeable on the product development because they participated in community advisory boards or other forums, maybe they could have a different status uh, similar to clinical investigators, for example, with different um, um, restrictions uh, on conflicts of, uh, of interest. Uh, we conduct research together with the EMA. There are a few examples of uh, projects uh, like Apathy, uh, that Thomas will uh, present or protect or some uh, recently published research on uh, patient reporting in the EU which is a new activity with the EMA and now we will work more on synergies with HTA and I think this is my last slide. These are some examples of uh, prototypes, experiments which are tested to present the benefit risk information using this kind of table or graphs or text and they have asked a certain number of patients who for the moment have indicated that this kind of presentation where you have some benefits and the numbers and some risks and the numbers are easier to understand than text or this kind of, uh, of graphics. So we'll see how we can incorporate this kind of new presentation of benefit risk in the package leaflet. There will be a meeting in June to discuss all this. So to conclude, I would say that Patients are fully integrated in the centralized procedure. Um, they bring their expertise to, to the table uh, with equal credibility as uh, other uh, experts. It's difficult to measure the impact of the patient contribution, but even to witness the regulatory process and to see how decisions are made uh, for transparency uh, purpose is really a, a major uh, achievement already. Thank you. Thank you, Francois. And now we have the next speaker, Nicolas Brook. And Nicolas um, is an economist by training. He's founder of the Synergist, a collective impact incubator that brings key players together in people in people-public-private partnerships with the express aim of solving significant societal pr problems through collective action. As an executive director of Patient Focused Medicine uh, Development, who, are, who is now representing, 
uh, in, in, in this conference, Nicholas helps foster a fertile environment to build a patient engagement through uh, collective work. So uh, we uh, want specifically in your case, uh, we, are, uh, we are very interested in how your organization contributes to gather the voice of, patient, of the patient throughout the life cycle of development medicines of medicines and also if there are any risk of patients to be being captured by the industry by the or by the regulators as uh, also um, Francois has mentioned so Nicolas uh, it's over to you thank you thank you very much um, so I'm very happy to be there uh, and I really like the, the quote uh, 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 that Francois mentioned about the dialogue and with a good dialogue we can only agree and I think it's not only between the regulator or the HTAs and patients, it's I think with all stakeholders including industry and I will explain why a bit later but even then they cannot fight a nonsense if, they, they, if there is a, a good dialogue. So actually I'm here to talk about Patient Focused Medicine Development. It's an initiative launched two years ago, uh, uh, PFMD. And actually, the reason why we created that initiative is the fragmentation. And the fragmentation of the patient engagement landscape has been illustrated since yesterday. A lot of initiatives, good practices, uh, sometimes anecdotal, a lack of evidence, uh, uh, and a lack of structure and a lack of model. And so the fragmentation happens in uh, different shape or forms. So first, the different goals. Uh, so different type of stakeholders have different pur purpose and perspectives. The second one is people with different approach to things. The last one, the third one, sorry, in the life cycle of medicine development, there is not necessarily a fluid uh, connection between the different points in which we can engage with patients, which is one of the burden uh, on the patient because they have to actually follow a process and engage many times for different and repeat the same thing several times. And so that's one of the fragmentation we want to address. And then of course, the geographic, so we had the example with the European aspects only for HTAs already, but imagine if we talk about all stakeholders at a global scale, it's very difficult to bring everybody around the table and have a consensus. So actually, PFMD is the result, is a response to this call for action. Uh, that was posted, uh, that was published uh, two years ago. And actually the goal, the, the purpose is not necessarily to reinvent the wheel, to do, um, uh, to reinvent something new. The purpose is really to address the gaps. And so that's what my organization, the Synergist I founded uh, four years ago is doing. Actually, we create the collaboration. We create the environment where it, it can happen. We create the collaborative leadership it needs. And that's what's missing. And so I'm very happy to be in a situation where we have um, uh, members that are funding that activity. So not a specific project, but the, the idea of collaborating together. So this is a, a visual presented uh, by a, a patient representative, Jan Geisler, and explaining that's what it feels sometimes to be a, a patient advocate. Uh, and so uh, that's uh, what you have to do. And so when we, it's really important to always think back about the patient organization. Uh, Francois mentioned the lack of resources. But uh, to get to the EMA, the, the patient itself has a personal story with plenty of issues. And on top of, of that, when it starts to engage as a patient advocate, there is a very long way to understand the system. The, one of the first barriers you will face will be the legal contract. It's a nightmare for patients uh, to understand what are the clauses, and sometimes there is really nonsense in these clauses they have to address. So actually, when they come at the HTA, uh, the assessment level, there is a very a long way already, uh, and there is a lot of pressure on them. So, on the other side, when you look at the healthcare system, that's what it looks like when we talk about patient engagement. Everybody is doing something, not agreeing, something different. I, I had a discussion, I heard it yesterday, even in the SCA world, not talking about patient engagement. But with UNETA, there is no consensus at the European level and it seems impossible to reach. Uh, that's the thing. Yeah. So, again, that was just one example within the SCA world and here we talk about the whole ecosystem. So. The, the big waves that the patient are seeing is actually a result of, uh, of, of that healthcare system uh, behavior or way of working to, today. So what we are doing is we are trying to build collective impact, to put everybody around the table, to bring some coherence uh, across the whole process. Uh, and we do that uh, by building this dialogue and the trust which is missing today. And at the end of the process, we want to highlight 
what is a systematic approach to patient engagement with a model for all stakeholders to do it, but not to do it in a bubble, to do it in coherence with all the other stakeholders. And so that's why we have created PFMD in 2015. And so we have this collaboration methodology, and that's what we want to make happen. But at the end, the deliverable is what we have called the meta framework. So big words, but so basically it's a methodology and the toolkit to make it happen. And meta because we know it will have to be adapted at a local level. It will have to be adapted for all the stakeholders. So we're not trying to say this is the A to Z way to make patient engagement happen, but we're trying to just capture the best practices to see this is the most coherent approach to it. Now take it and make it your own. And so that's the end goal of PFMD. Now, to make this collaboration happen, you know, you first need to, to have uh, what I call the safe harbor. So we need to create trust. We need an environment where people will have a dialogue, and not just because they come once to a meeting, but because there is a long-term relationship. And so we have, uh, we have created, so these are our members to date. So we have one HTA representative, uh, HTA International, uh, that joined uh, early this year. Uh, and then we have industry and patient organization. The presence of industry, always the question that everybody has around the table. So we have built in the governance a maximum of representation. So we have a, in blue, you have the, the decision body, and in orange, the operational body. The decision body is represented, so we have the members. Uh, 21 members will be joined by Takeda and by Involve, uh, a research and citizen involvement uh, project uh, in the UK. We, we have like uh, so 23 members, uh, and uh, actually in the advisory committee, we have more patient representation than any, anybody else. I think it's 56%. But in the governance, there is a top up of 50% for industry and a minimum of 30% for the patient organization. And so that's written in the governance, and that's how we want to build transparency. Now, the other way to, 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 to make sure that there is this dialogue is trust is to join. Uh, PFMD to be part of it, to be at the table, because very often we receive material even when there is evidence. We know that evidence alone without trust doesn't work. We have the Trump example in the US. So uh, even that, what I'm really looking for and what I'm happy to be here is to actually have more HG representation within PFMD. Now we create a governance uh, that we have to to live and breathe, to, to, to maintain, to build and maintain credibility in the long term. But now we need to see what we are facing. The, we are not there to reinvent the wheel, so we want to create a map. And so, Sami mentioned uh, the repository a little bit uh, earlier today. That's uh, one of the first things we did to actually see who is doing what, what are the results, uh, and where we are going with that. I will come back to it in a moment. But in, in uh, it's a very few um, visuals for the moment. So we have, we have in 10 months, we have 164 initiatives in the system, which represent close to 160 organizations and 200 patient engagement leaders in these organizations. And we have all of them in the system. And it's not us doing a desk research, because we started with a desk research. We found things, but actually, the public available information is really not uh, very informative. It's a lot of claim, but we don't know what are the real outputs. So we reversed the process and we asked for people to fill in what they are doing by themselves in a descriptive way for the moment, but I will come back to that. As a result, we have a map that I will show in more detail after with these initiatives, that's a list of initiatives. We have a lot of visualization of who is doing what, when, and with who. I will show that in more detail. And then we have reports for your organizations or for your sector of activity. And I'll come back to that in a minute, but in this case, you see, for example, that. Uh, there are a lot of uh, initiatives covering advocacy, research, but there is much less uh, in terms of um, access to markets for that organization. So that's the type of uh, visual output of who is doing what today. I'll come back to, it in, to that in a minute. Once we know what's happening out there and who is doing what, actually we want, we are bidding knowledge, we also have done literature research and all this type of information and knowledge building. But now the second step is the defining the key criteria. So it's not about going to a result already, but it's about sitting with everybody around the table and thinking, okay, what do we have to do? What are the activities we are, we are taking together and how we will do it? In, in uh, phase three, we will have some pilots. 
in uh, phase four, we will have what I call a toolkit. A toolkit for me is not just a piece of paper. A toolkit is, of course, the documentation, but also uh, the tools like the mapping tool that I will show in a minute, uh, or the, the expert or a pool of consultants that can help patient engagement to happen as a third party. Just to give you a concrete example so on how we build knowledge, uh, and uh, we will publish about that, it's very interesting, uh, in a, it's in a few months. We have done the patient engagement stakeholder expectation matrix. So before going into addressing a problem, we want to understand who expects what in terms of patient engagement. But not in terms of patient engagement, but in terms of other stakeholders. Uh, so what patient expect from industry, from HTE, from regulators, and so on. And the other way around, what HTE are expecting from all the other stakeholders. And you will see that we can already identify big gaps. We have run 59 interviews with, uh, I think we have six HTEs representing from Europe uh, in these interviews. And actually, I have, the, I have a preview on the results. Uh, and actually, we can see that uh, HCP sees that their role primarily as um, uh, recruiting for a clinical trial. All the other stakeholders think that they have a key connecting role all across the process, but there is a big gap already in terms of expectation there. The regulators doesn't feel uh, it should regulate patient engagement. Uh, all the other stakeholders are waiting the regulation to come to say how, how it, should be, it should happen. And that's the result of the interviews, and we will publish about that. That's one type of exercise again, in terms of creating collaboration to understand who is expecting what is a very important starting point. Also to assess the progress as we move forward. Then we have to deep dive into what are the, the, the practices and the good practices uh, at each uh, different phase in the life cycle of uh, drug development. So in this case, um, we have three working groups, uh, so the discovery phase, the clinical phase, including regulatory, and then the post-launch activities. With these three groups, we have defined some priorities. So now, again, not going directly to the end result, we first are looking at uh, what are the good practices we can see today and why there are good practices. So when we discuss the why, actually the goal is first to identify, to identify the criteria. What makes a good practices good? So we have something we can apply to any new uh, initiative and something we can assess because what's missing very often in terms of patient engagement is the assessment and the impact about it. Now going back to the mapping tool and I really invite you because I discussed, I heard there are plenty of initiatives always a little bit isolated and the goal we are trying to achieve with the mapping tool is actually make sense of all what's existing today. So we have these 164 initiatives each um, color is actually representing what type of stakeholder. And then you have the, the, the simple circle in red, you have the star, and you have the, the, the other wheel with the little things. Um, so that's uh, actually uh, the first one is a patient, initi patient engagement initiative that are doing the patient engagement. So it's in a clinical trial uh, protocol design, working with them. The simple circle is when it's an initiative about patient engagement to improve it but not doing it. And the last one is an initiative that does one of the first two, but on top of that, there is an investment uh, to the patients, like a training program, an education program, something that helps the patient build capacity at his hand and will be an investment for the long term. From this one and another 60, um, 160 initiatives, we have actually created different views. So in this case, we have patient types and levels of expertise because we always patient engagement is not just patient engagement we have to discuss is it is it informing the patient is it consulting the patient is it involving the patient or is it co-designing with an actual voting part uh, at the end of the process when uh, is it in terms of the patient uh, experience so is it uh, when he has been just diagnosed uh, with no expertise yet uh, is it later in the process uh, so that's how we have split this initiative we you see the bubble, so that's the number of initiatives we have in each bubble, so we can already see where things are happening uh, more or less. And you can click on the bubble and identify, for example, what are the 30 initiatives within that bubble. That was one view. We also have the geographic scope. Is it global, regional, national? Uh, we have the map where we can put all initiatives. We have um, uh, the 
where is it in the life cycle of medicine development? Is it in discovery phase, is it in sponsor launch, and all the phase in between? Again, the same initiatives. Each time you can again click and see who is behind these initiatives. Is it a disease-specific initiative? Is it for a therapeutic area, or is it for several of them? Uh, is it about access, advocacy, community building, education, innovation, policy, or research? All the same initiatives have replied to the same questionnaire, so we can really organize them. This is an example of more of uh, on the bubble with six initiatives, and you can click uh, and you can click and see the initiatives. And for example, here you can click and see the description of your party. You see who is the contact person, and so actually that leads me to the next step of this project, which we are about to launch in a couple of uh, next week normally. I hope so. If uh, the debugging is going well, uh, it's the networking part. So we want to add the LinkedIn of patient engagement to this tool. So in this case, we have Nicola Bellington, only one person. In uh, next week, you will have all the participants to this project. The one that come again is a crowdsourced uh, tool, so we try to feed it, but the actual users feed the information. And so in this case, we would like to see all the participants to, to your party. Uh, and they will have a profile with their expertise, what they would like to work on, where they, they are happy to support uh, moving forward. So we are trying to build a, a tool for patient engagement to happen. And they will be the DHT expertise, of course, represented in the tool. I'm going to the end. So you have all the features to search initiatives, people, organizations that uh, reply to some criterions uh, that uh, you will want to, to identify. This is the list of initiatives. And then you have some reports specific to your organization in terms of what you do or you don't do. So. If we want to break all these boundaries, if we want to have the patient uh, to uh, facing not a big way but something more sustainable because actually it makes sense, it's not plenty of different activities, it's one coherent flow of activities, I will invite you to come and put your initiatives on the table. You, you were asking uh, Tammy, Tammy for the crowdsource uh, repository, it's there, it's online and actually if you want, if you have feedback, if you are missing something, we will do it because our goal is to make it happen. The second thing is that, and it, it joins, I think, some, uh, some of the slides from uh, Francois, is where are you on the patient impact map? And actually, in this case, it's a slide that, uh, that has been offered by uh, Bettina Rill, a patient uh, representative well known. Uh, and actually, she's advocating for, for having the patient across the whole life cycle and shows the impact it has if we do it in that sense. So in, in, in green is uh, what's happening today, in red is what should happen to have more impact uh, globally speaking. The question I have is uh, for HTAs is like, where do you uh, interact? Uh, in the discussion I had so far, there is a wish not to wait the assessment part, but to be involved uh, much earlier in the process, to build the trust and the dialogue much earlier on. And then when we come to the assessment part, it's actually much easier to, to move forward in a coherent way. And then, you know, I showed you the boat uh, as uh, I feel it is uh, in the beginning of the presentation. This is the boat that PFMD is trying to create, a boat where we all sail together much faster um, and looking in the same direction with obvious differences, but uh, uh, one goal altogether. So this is my invitation for uh, the end of this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tamás. I, uh, Nicolas, sorry, and I open the floor, the floor, uh, the discussion to the floor. If there is any questions, please raise your hand. Meanwhile, you are think about possible questions. I will would like to uh, ask you something. Um, I think you have been mainly talking about medicines, but in terms of drugs, I imagine. Uh, what about uh, medical devices or other kinds of technologies? Uh, which are your experiences in, in, that, uh, in that area? Uh, I would say we haven't been as active with medical devices as we should have or compared to medicines for different reasons. First, the regulation of these medical devices is so much more complex that for organizations even to start understanding how it, they are regulated is a problem. Secondly, 
in their indication, it doesn't necessarily contain the name of a disease. So for patient organizations to realize which medical devices are of importance, of interest to them, if they can't read the name of their disease, then they may not think, well, this is something we should be working on. It's not as immediate, as straightforward as for, for medicines. And, but that is changing, and it depends also what we mean by medical devices. And uh, this is something we need to bring to discussion with the UNETA. There, there are, for, for example, mobile health applications, uh, which patients are using. And, and some of them help to diagnose diseases, but with false negative. That's one issue. To, to, to whom do we turn to when we have concerns about such devices? Or data protection uh, using health uh, apps. Do we, to whom do we turn to? Who regulates these, uh, these aspects? It's not as clear as it is for, for medicines, but we definitely need to learn. Uh, the new regulation has just been uh, adopted, and uh, soon it will be published, so we definitely need ourselves to organize our, our organizations to, to work on this. So from the, the PFMD side, um, it was a discussion in the beginning to, to, to decide do we do everything at once or do we focus on medicine first because of the people we had around the table. So because the moment you think about a, a patient perspective, actually there should, no be, there should not be a separation. The separation comes from the system, but if you think from the patient point of view, it should be integrated. Uh, so what we have decided to do uh, within PFMD is to have as a vision to think all integrated but to start as a first phase uh, to focus on medicine only. The, the good news, and it was last Monday, we had actually started to see some um, uh, device initiatives popping up on the tool uh, that I just uh, showed. Uh, so it's not perfectly, uh, it's not a perfect fit yet, but already they would like to be on the patient engagement map that we have built at the the global scale, so that's that's a sign that what we are doing for the collaboration is, uh, is already open for the device uh, part. More questions? Okay. A question for Francois. <laughs> you have a role in EMA as patient, but possibly you have another role in EMA in what, say, a few years ago was called comitology, or comitology en, en français, that is the study of the dynamics of committees, and playing uh, a classical role of being the odd man out, being the, the lay person there. Hmm? That is to prevent a tunnel vision and put some street view, some distance. Now, for that to work, and in the business literature and case studies, there is significant mass of, uh, of reasons that that should be in any executive board of any institution to have one or two people out of the field. That's a well-made point. But these people have to have some sort of empowerment. Being very cynical, say put a cardinal or someone like that in the board of Volkswagen. <laughs> Is that consistent with your experience? And the quest to narrow the question, it's relevant the degree of personal empowerment to feel at ease there. Hmm? Yeah. To comment on that? Yeah, the, the way it works at the EMA, for example, right as we speak, the, the last two committees which don't involve patient or external experts uh, full time as full members, so the CHMP, and the other one is the Herbal Medicinal Committee. But we, at the PCWP, worked with them to have observers, some of us, who attend the meetings of this committee. And after a certain period, they will report back to the PCWP to explain what would be uh, the kind of training or activity that patients who will volunteer to become members of that committee will have to, to show, to, to benefit from. So we are learning by piloting and observing the functioning of some committees what it means in terms of patient participation in the committees to prepare the, the future calls for members to become mem patients to become members of this committee. So we are learning by observing, proposing adaptations. I don't know if this 
committees as organized at the EMA is the best way an agency can uh, base decisions on, but this is not our remit. That's the European legislator to decide, but for the if there is a European agency or scientific secretariat for HTA, I think we should have this discussion. What could be the best kind of structure for a committee uh, working on HTA at the European level? In terms of composition, preparation, training, I think these are questions we have to revisit. If I, if I can build, uh, I just would like to take the the discussion on committee is an opportunity to mention that there's, there is a trend right now, and I see that with the, the strongest patient organization, to actually move away from a simple representation, uh, not move away, but to use a committee uh, to bring evidence, and not just to, to, to speak in the name, but with no evidence uh, to, uh, of the patients. And so now there is a, a trend to really develop how can we as a patient organization, how can we bring the representation of much more patients? And I've heard that at the beginning, it's the topic of the ESMO conference later this year, but that's something that's coming to, to move away a little bit from the always the same. I heard that uh, yesterday, I think, always the same people coming to the table and to make sure we have a good representation, it was also mentioned this morning, to make sure we have a good representation where we attend the committee. Any other questions? I, I would like also to add a little bit on that. I, I would like to ask Francois, uh, what are you doing to improve representativity and diversity in the committees, because especially in rare disease where clinical aspects of the disease can be really, really diverse for patients. Are you taking this into account? How, how are you managing this diversity and representativity issues? Maybe we could discuss more the experts and less the committees, because of the committees it's fewer patients, but the experts, all the patients invited, consulted by the committees or, or others. Uh, I think we always try to find patients in all countries, not just in the UK because they are close and it's uh, low, low, low cost, but uh, we always try to, to, to diversify the, the patients we will contact. We discuss with the EMA the type of patients, the, the stage of disease that they, they, they would best need. Uh, we have our own criteria when we, for example, realize that some patients may have close links with the company and, for example, uh, that it does not fully respect the code of practices then we investigate more with these patients to make sure that it doesn't stop somewhere at the evaluation of their conflict of interest declaration. Um, but we, we certainly try to diversify in terms of uh, uh, different knowledge, and sometimes when two are invited, one already participated in scientific advice and is very knowledgeable of the process, and the other one may be more naive. Uh, one may be participating in a clinical trial and not the, the other. One may be a man and the other one a, a woman. Where we have a problem is for children, well, uh, young, uh, younger patients. And the EMA is developing a, a new framework to, in, to involve patients uh, of that age, less than uh, 18. It's not easy, but uh, we, we are thinking uh, of it. But the diversification is certainly uh, an objective we, we, we have. And the same for the, the SEED uh, HTA uh, early dialogues, where uh, we contributed to identify patients to, to these meetings, where we also try to diversify with patients of different origins, different countries, uh, different gender, etc. Thank you. Well, if there are no more questions, um, thank you for your participation, your presentations, and I ask the next speakers to join me here. Next speaker is Tamash Berekji. Tamash, uh, 
comes from the European Patients Academy, EUPATI. He's currently, currently working as a communications advisor at the, of the European, European AIDS Treatment Group, the largest European network of individu individuals living with HIV. He's HIV positive science to 2003, originally a linguist and psychologist, Tamash is set to defend his PhD based on research into the significance and perspective of patients, patient organizations in Europe in this light year, year in 2017. So, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, it actually it all brings it brings everything beautifully together, what we've been talking about in the last um, one and a half days. Um, I will be talking about um, uh, UPATI, um, the European Patient Academy on Therapeutic Innovation, which does one thing, and that's patient education, which is, I think, absolutely key, as you will see. Um, and it gives, a, it gives one answer to all the questions or to various questions that were raised um, during, the, during the last uh, presentations. And I will, I will make um, a number of references to um, to your presentations that we, or, or to, to some presentations that we heard uh, right now. So UPATI is the, the European Patient Academy for Therapeutic Innovation, um, which is, um, which is some, some, somebody asked me yesterday, is this an organization or is this a project? This is in between. So it is, it is a project, it started out as a project funded by uh, the Innovative Medicines Initiative of the European Union, and then it evolved into an organization, actually. So we are somewhere between, I mean, transitioning from, from being a project uh, into, into becoming a proper organization, if you like. Um, uh, I will also talk about, what, I mean, why it was necessary to have uh, UPATI, what have we achieved so far, and um, I will talk about um, our guidance uh, as regards uh, patient involvement in health technology assessment. So uh, to set the background or the landscape a little bit, um, this is where we are. This is where we are coming from. Um, we understand that there's a, there's a very rapid change uh, going on in, in in health research, in biomedical research, and also in policy. And we can also see that research and policy go hand in hand together. And I will come back to this um, again and again, and I will, I will try to argue uh, by the end of this presentation that we find it's impossible to make any meaningful in, or, or have any meaningful involvement in policy work, which is actually what we do here as well, without having the scientific background, without having the knowledge that you need to, to make your voice heard. And that's what we try to convey to patient uh, advocates, or as we call them, patient experts. Um, so we know that, that innovation that's happening um, in, uh, in, in biomedical research or in health research um, transforms the lives of, of, of patients with serious uh, and or lifelong conditions. So by all calculation, myself, uh, having lived with HIV for, for more than a decade, um, I should have been dead by now had it not been for biomedical research. So it's, it, it's, it's, it's happening at a very rapid pace. Nobody believed 10 years ago when, um, when, when, when I was starting my career as a patient advocate that we would be talking about curing HIV in 2017, right? So there's a very rapid change in, in, in all of this, and there are all these new things happening that you will be, that you will be aware of. Um, my daughter is, for example, she's becoming a genetic engineer in, in biomedical research. She's, she does drug research. When I was a child, nobody spoke about genetic engineering. What's that, right? So it's, it's really happening very, uh, very quickly, and there are all these new new areas, new uh, areas of research, there are all these new concepts that you have to familiarize uh, yourselves with. Um, and also we, we, we see that there's this whole new field of interaction where you need to be active. Um, and we also understand that legally, but also ethically, it's a requirement to have people, patients, who are actually at the farthest 
end of this whole process. So who are the consumers, by the way, also the taxpayers, uh, who, who will take these these medicines or these health technologies, these interventions, so that they are involved in this process. So it's, it's not just something that happens about them, but it happens with them, which makes sense, I think. So you have to be, uh, you have to be involved with the public. There's also an involvement or a requirement uh, of involvement with, with competent authorities, uh, also in, in, uh, in ethics uh, committees, HDA agencies, this is why we are here, and there's, there's, a, there's a growing need for patients to be involved in clinical research, where they are, they can be a driving force of clinical research, they can be co-researchers, they can also be reviewers of, of ongoing research or protocols, they can be advisors, they can be information providers, and they can also be the research subjects, which is probably the most common thing right now. But actually we have to build all of these capacities. Now, we also looked at Eupathy, at, at and this is again, you always get the same names actually. So, this is from Jan, Jan Geisler and Bettina Rill, that was um, uh, just, I mean, she was just mentioned, um, and, uh, and a couple of other people. Uh, it's, it's a very, it's a close, it's a tightly knit network of, uh, of people and experts working in this. So, we looked at the whole. Um, uh, life cycle of research and development and we try to understand how patients or where patients need to be and can be involved. And we found out that actually it's the whole spectrum of, of medicine development or of health technology development if you like, um, where it's, it's essential that patients are continuously involved and can make an input into this process. But if you look at this, it's, it's, a very, it's a very complex, it's a very complicated, and it's a very long process. So, it, you know, it might take up to 10 years or even longer um, uh, from setting research priorities, so from, from the very early clinical uh, phases to, um, to the distribution of the, of the, of the drug or of the, of the health technology. So it is, it is a long process and this needs, this needs considerable capacity development. So it's not like you just get into this and then you do it. So, um, why is it going back? Okay, so this is, um, this is then actually the question. Do we have these people? And we just, we just heard this from Nicholas. No, we don't. It's, that's one of the reasons why that's one of the reasons why you keep meeting always the same people, because you don't have enough expert patients. It's always, you know, it's always Jan Geisler, who's an expert patient. Or it's always Betty Naril, who's an expert patient. Or it's always me, who's, who also happened to be an expert patient. So it's, but we need more, we need more people. It just can't be, because, you know, it's, it's, uh, Francois cannot be sitting in all, on all of the committees or my colleagues at the ATG. The ATG is, by the way, that AIDS group that Francois was referring to, which has been working with the, um, or which was the first to work with the, with the EMA. So we have been doing this for 25 years, but we need more people in order to be, you know, to be able to respond to all of this need. This is why UPATI is needed. This is why we need a patient academy which conveys this knowledge, which conveys these skills to um, patient advocates um, uh, and, and turns them into expert patients who can then make meaningful uh, impact or have meaningful involvement uh, in the medicine um, uh, development process. So how this came about was um, um, Originally, Ingrid Klingmann, a professor from uh, Germany, uh, whom I'm replacing at this conference uh, right now, uh, had the idea that uh, a building on some previous projects, that maybe we should then do something together on a European level, and maybe we should develop a patient academy for, for people who are interested. And then let's not stop there. Let's not just train expert patients, but let's also make this information available to the general public. If they are interested or if anyone is interested in learning more about medicine development, let's provide this information to them. And that's what we have been doing for the last five years. So the first stage of UPATI stopped um, uh, or ended uh, this January, and now we are in the second phase of Vipati. 
The first phase was originally funded by IMI. I don't know how much you know about the, uh, the Innovative Medicines Initiative. However, it provided half of the half of the of the money that was needed to set up UPATI and to run it, and then the other half by IMI regulations was provided by the pharmaceutical industry. So it was a consortium of more than 30 um, uh, pharmaceutical companies which provided in-kind contributions. Now, of course, we can talk about the ethics of receiving money from um, from industry sources, that will be a different talk. Uh, but I think it's, it's, it's absolutely essential that you yourselves, working in HTA, also see that this is something that requires money and resources and funds. It's not something that you can expect people to do free of charge all the time. So they will be willing to volunteer for a while, but not forever. So this was launched in 2012. Um, um, as a public-private partnership. It still is a public-private partnership, but right now it's run and operated by, uh, by the European Patients Forum. Where's Valentina? She was here a minute ago. Oh, there you are. So um, it's hosted by the European Patients Forum, and it's still a consortium of, um, of uh, more than uh, 30 different uh, stakeholders public uh, partners, industry, patient organizations, umbrellas and patient organizations. Um, and it does continue right now as a permanent educational program. So the third round of uh, expert patient uh, training uh, course is um, it has been recruited or the recruitment process is, uh, is going on now and uh, the course will start uh, at the end of, uh, or early September rather, this September. So um, there is an extra training course. If you look at what we do, um, is uh, we look at the whole, we look at the whole spectrum of um, of um, of medicine development, and we try to provide the right information and the right tools to become part of this of this process. If you if that's what you want to do. Um, so we have the UPATI patient expert uh, uh, training course, which is specifically for, for, for expert patients. It's a, it's a rather large course, uh, which uh, lasts uh, 13, 14 months. Um, it includes um, a very substantial online training element, which is provided through a closed um, um, e-learning platform. Uh, Moodle, you probably know this, it's very widely used, but there are also other platforms. Um, so we use Moodle, and we also complement this with face-to-face -face training events, which, uh, which were held in Barcelona, um, and now we don't know where they will be held, uh, the, the next ones, but um, that's, that's, where we, that's where we usually went. So when we get together for four days or five, and we uh, go through all the materials once again with the trainees. Um, uh, a total of uh, 96 uh, fellows have graduated from, uh, from uh, the UPATI training course over the course of the last three years, and another 40 to 50 people will be recruited uh, for this uh, next course. Now, the other product, if you like, uh, go back. The other product, if you like, uh, is the toolbox. The toolbox is on the website. So if you go to the UPATI website, which is www.upati.eu, uh, you will find a search field for the toolbox where if you enter any concept, any term related to um, uh, medicine development, then you will get a list of articles which contain uh, this particular term. So if you want to look up something about statistics or how to interpret uh, protocols, how to read protocols, how, to, um, uh, how the whole pharmaceutical development research and development process works, you can just go to the toolbox and you can run a search according to topics or you can run a search according to um, uh, keywords and you will, you will find all the information that's relevant to that particular topic in seven languages. So you will see that this is uh, now in these languages and we are working on the Romanian version and on the Portuguese version because we are going to roll out UPATI in Brazil, which is our next uh, step. We've been invited by several Brazilian uh, um, patient organization umbrellas and we are, this is news from today, so I just got this phone call today earlier. Um, 
this is why I had to sneak out from the meeting. Um, and and we, will go, we, we, will, we will implement the whole UPATI package in Portuguese in Brazil. And then there's the, the UPATI, oops, the UPATI Internet Library, um, which, is, um, which is a glossary of terms, um, everything explained in lay language, once again, in all seven languages, um, for the general public. If you're interested in any term related to medicine development, you just go there and you can learn about it. So, the training course, always a huge success. Um, we also have uh, a network of national platforms of, U uh, of UPETI. For example, we have UPETI Spain, which was mentioned uh, here in the previous uh, session as well. Um, and um, and the national platforms, um, what they do is they implement um, uh, the UPATI packages and the, the whole UPATI concept on a national level. I mean, this, this really makes sense. So, um, if you want to, if you want to learn more about uh, what we do in your language, in your country, then you just approach the national platforms, and they will provide you information uh, on that. They, they try to form sort of an umbrella or a, a, a network of, uh, of, uh, of like-minded individuals. We have 18 plus UPATI national platforms. It's like it's 18 plus because they come and go. Um, so we have new ones emerging. Uh, we have um, sometimes uh, platforms that are a little more silent in Austria, for example, but then they come back again and they get stronger. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a process that's uh, that's ongoing right now. Uh, this is what they do. That's I think that's pretty um, uh, easy. Um, it's worth. I mean, it really makes sense to approach them because they they do really good work. So we also did one thing, another uh, important product that you will find on the website. Uh, we developed guidances, guidance documents for um, various stakeholders um, to uh, to work with. I just put it down because otherwise I press it. Uh, so, um, for for various stakeholders to work with with patients and with patient organizations. So there is a guidance for uh, uh, patients working with regulators or regulators working with patients. We have another one for uh, HGA bodies, yet another one for industry, and a fourth one for ethics committees. These are large, complex documents. Right now they are only available in English, but the translations have been done into all the other languages. Um, uh, they are being reviewed, so they will be uploaded to the website very soon. But right now you will find the English versions on the website. So. Why is it important that we, that we have these guidances? Because you heard that there are various models that, um, that, are, that are going around um, and, and uh, everybody has a different approach, especially there's a huge difference, even a schism between what industry does or wants to do and what patients or patient groups want to do. So therefore we found that maybe it's time to bring these parties together, sit down and discuss what are our, what are the common points? What is it where we can actually interact? Um, so therefore, UPATI, which is a consortium of all of these stakeholders who are involved in in medicine development, we sat down, we sat together, we spent two years developing these guidances, and then we tried to distill what's you know what is what is the common what are the common points? What is it that you can build on? Um, there's a lot here, actually, when, we, when, when I talk about HJ, there's a lot that's in line with what Tammy was talking about, because we follow, to some extent, the Canadian model. So, um, uh, because it was, it, 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 because you've been doing it pretty well for pretty long. So that's, uh, that's why we, we thought that it makes sense. Um, so we, we understand that there's a, there's a need for wider involvement of patients and patient organizations, which calls for some sort of understanding or common ground. Um, also, um, it just, it just makes, makes sense to provide this guidance when it's missing, and we see that, therefore, some, sometimes there's no integrity, like these stories that, that Francois also told, that you need to make sure that expert patients also understand the ethical aspects of what they do, so it's they need to be educated about that too. Um, 
And also we need to do something about language because we understand that the use of language in, in, in medicine development is oftentimes a deterrent for patients to get involved. So it's a two-way process. You have to, to some extent, dumb down the language of, uh, of, uh, of science being used um, uh, for patients to, to understand. And on the other hand, you have to educate patients and expert patients primarily to understand the language of science in order to be able to participate or to sit at the table um, um, in a meaningful way. So, yes, I'm rushing through the rest. Um, so this is, this is how it looks like. You can download the document uh, in PDF format and, um, and also or the documents rather. So it's on the, it's on the website, this uh, screenshots. Uh, the screenshot shows you where, you where you can find it on the website, but it's very straightforward. And then uh, you can work with it. Um, and your questions are, of course, very, uh, very welcome. So if you look at the HTA uh, guidance, then it gives a definition of terms, which is, I think, um, very easy. It also gives a definition of the rationale, why we do this. And I'm not doing anything. Um, and it also gives the basic tenets of our work. And this is, this is the exact same thing what Tammy uh, uh, said in her presentation. So we say that, it, that it's, it's about relevance, it's about fairness, it's about equity, legitimacy, and it's about capacity building. So these are the key objectives that we focus on the interaction with, um, with HTA bodies. So it gives a practical guidance uh, to, to HTA bodies on what to do and how to do it, but it also gives a practical guidance for patient organizations, PO means patient organizations, on what to do and how to do it. So it, the, the, the ultimate goal is to make sure that it's not just tokenistic involvement, so it's not just that you get a patient on board and then there he or she sits and he or she is cute, but that, and we can tick a box, but it's also that, that there is actual work being done. Um, so, this is what we want to see happen, uh, and I don't know to what extent it's readable. Um, so we want to we want outreach and education, so that patients. I mean, this is that's weird. Um, it's not my fault. You can see. So it's um, um, maybe if I jump, then it goes. No. So so that there is outreach and education, there's wider involvement of patients, and also that there is resource provision, and this is extremely important. Because it is, you cannot expect from patients or patient organizations that they will be able to, to provide the necessary resources. It's up to um, HTA bodies to provide these resources. So you cannot do this work for years and years on end as a volunteer. So there must be some fees, some remuneration. This doesn't always have to be money. This can be invitations to conferences, this can be facilitation of publications, any kind of support that, that will provide additional resources to the expert patients who do this work must be there, because otherwise they will just, you know, they die. So they just, they, they, they get overworked and they just disappear from the process. Um, reimburse, reimbursement of costs. Um, also, it's for HTA bodies to help with, uh, with travel and accommodation arrangements. And it's again for HTA bodies to understand what the special needs of patients are. So patients do have or might have special needs, dietary needs, um, travel arrangements, wheelchairs, you know, so it's, it, is, it is a much more complex thing than you, would, than you would think first. It's not just simple logistics, but it's a little more complex. Um, and what, what we offer in exchange is to provide this knowledge, is to provide this understanding of what's going on in, uh, in, in medicine development from the patient's perspective. So reflecting the lived experience of the patient and, and the life world of the patient and bring that knowledge into the discourse in a language, in a way that's understandable 
that's understandable also to the researchers and to the scientists and to the political decision makers who are involved in this process. So you provide the environment for patients to, to, to get involved and we provide the patients who can be involved because they speak the language, they understand what's going on, they understand the system. So that's how we try to bring all of this together. Um, I assume that, that the slides will be sent out or they made available. They will be excellent, so you can read all of this. But it's also actually part of the guidance document, so you will find it uh, online as well. So it's two very basic and simple principles that we follow. One is, which I was already referring to, that scientific involvement and policy work must go together. You cannot, you cannot do meaningful policy involvement if you don't understand the science that's behind, if you don't have the evidence. And this is again, this was, this was uh, mentioned by Tammy, but also by others, that this is evidence. What we patients bring to the table is actually evidence. Even if it sounds anecdotal, we know how to turn this into evidence, and that's what Eupathy teaches to expert patients. And the other thing is, it's just knowledge. It's, it's only knowledge. You don't become a doctor, or you don't become a statistician, or you don't become a, a, a social scientist or a pharmacoeconomist because God appointed you to be one. But you become one because you studied. And if you could study this, then I can study this. So I study sociology, social psychology, linguistics, what not. I have like a plethora of diplomas. So why couldn't I learn about immunology if that's what I need? And we needed that in AIDS. We needed that in HIV because nobody else was doing it. So we have this tradition of learning our stuff and getting our stuff together. And this is what we can convey to, to other patient act, activists in other disease areas. So it's, it's pretty simple. We can bring this knowledge to the table, but then you must be forthcoming, you must be welcoming this knowledge that we bring to the table. And that's where the guidance documents come in and help you organize this process. So you can reach me or us anytime. Um, I will, if you have questions, I will just forward them to, uh, to my colleagues who are more able to answer them, or I answer them if I can. Okay, so that's that's what I wanted to talk about. Thank you. Thank you, Tamash. And now we have the last speaker, Isabel Lamo. She comes from the Spanish uh, Patients Forum. She's a researcher at the Albert Jubell Public Health Institute at the Uni International University of Catalonia, WIC. And in the past, uh, she has worked at, uh, as a patient advocacy for a pharmaceutical company, industry, in industry. And at the moment, she's working in a project related to the de detection of patients' associations needs. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Isabel, and I give you the floor. Thank you. First of all, uh, I'm so sorry, but I, I haven't prepared the presentation in English because it was very fast and I speak in Spanish. Um, I'm so sorry, <laughs> and I started because I think it's better for, for all, <laughs> and I explain you. Okay. I give you five, two minutes to to pick up the translation machine. Okay. Eh, para... Do you want to go there? Oh, sí, yes, sí, no? Mientras esperamos, os explico un poquito por qué... While we wait, I can explain to you why I'm here. I am representing the Spanish Patient Forum. I am a researcher at the Institute of Virgilville of Public Health. <laughs> of the International University of Catalonia. We collaborate with the Spanish Patient Forum and in social research and the scientific counselor is Dr. Navarro, Dolores Navarro. So to start with, I will 
mention the topics I want to talk about. We we'll want to talk about the experiences in the Spanish patient forum in terms of assessment. I want to talk about the situation in Spain, in patients' associations, how they see themselves in this process of involvement. So first of all, I will explain where this forum comes from. The Barcelona Declaration in 2003 was signed by 50 associations. They met Dr. Albert Jubel, who was an icon in the patient involvement movement in Spain. So they decided to create an association or a a federation of associations and the Barcelona Declaration is a list of 10 points that explains the information process, the decision-making process and the participation and involvement of process of patients. The Spanish Patients Forum was launched in 2004 after the Barcelona Declaration and during in these 13 years the SPF has been doing different activities, um, larger activities, with some specialization. It now represents 32 organizations and over 1,000 associations representing 10 million people. The associations are the federations. In March this year, a meeting was held among 55 associations to create an update of the Barcelona Declaration because um, many years have lapsed. Um, some organizations are more professional now, although still we have a long way to go. And this meeting resulted in these 10 points, these 10 items, but we want to focus on item number 10, sorry, number 9, which is the promotion in, of for the NI, research development and innovation. The patients want to get involved in that process, which in Spain is quite difficult. So they wanted to get involved in that and they, they want to focus on that. And now I'm going to talk about some theoretical points. When do patients come into play? Is there um, a specific point in time? Are they really at the core of the process? Are they really involved since the beginning of the process? So, Dr. Jouvet, back then, showed us these five questions. It's, this is like the DSM, the um, book that is used in psychiatry, in the psychiatry field, with the five questions that we need to ask ourselves to know whether we're acting well or no, or not. So do patients participate in the institutions, governing bodies, is healthcare, organized around patients' agendas, are the professionals trained in patients' communication techniques and cognitive and emotional care, is healthcare organized to achieve integrated global and coordinated care, do they um, collaborate with the associations, do health institutions provide information about their care activity and the results obtained, so we need to make sure with these questions uh, whether the associations are taking all these aspects into account or not. So there is much to do, but it is ongoing. It is. We are on our way to the to the goal. Patients are acquiring new roles, are making decisions, are assessors. But it is necessary. We have to differentiate between the sick population, the patients who make individual decisions when or from the general populations, the citizens, the patients who represent a group of people at a certain point, for example, when assessing a drug. In that case, they make 
collective decisions. We have a postgraduate degree in advocacy for patient associations and one of the comments by the associations is that sometimes they feel awkward because they don't have the time to prepare their uh, input for a forum. Sometimes they have to assess a um, drag and they have to say whether it is useful for them or not. They feel awkward, they don't feel at ease, so they need some training in order for them to know so that they can know what to do. So a patient comes from a passive participation towards an active participation. But in a patient association, uh, patient associations are very big, some of them. For the smaller ones, the um, governing body is sometimes is quite small. They don't have the capacity to make uh, far-reaching decisions. So we need to encourage them, we need to endorse them and support them. It will want to increase the quality of the communication coming from the association. So they need to know how to defend their users' rights and they need technical knowledge and technical skills for them to be able in certain fora. So they need training. This is the reality that patients live. This is an example you know, but I want to explain it anyway. A citizen or a patient can be a father, a mother, the son, the daughter to someone, a friend, an architect, a driver, a cleaner, an economist, who happens to have a disease. So they can enroll in a patient association and they can even become a patient representative. So he has, or they have, an experience with the disease that we cannot know as clinicians, but that people, those people, need skills, need to be trained, but to what extent? In, in Spain, in many conferences, this thing is always repeated. We need to train the patients, we need to train them, we need to give them skills. But how? We need to provide them with skills so that they can defend themselves, they can act properly, they can contribute properly to the forum. It's like when buying a car, a new car. I don't want to have the kind of knowledge um, an engineer has. I don't want to to manufacture my own car. I just want to know how a car works so that I can choose the one that is best suited for me. Well, the same thing goes for the patient. We don't want them to be clinicians or doctors. We just want them to be able to interact with us. So we need to encourage and we need to boost their skills without imposing on them the burden that we sometimes impose on them uh, because they, they have a lot of knowledge that we need from them. So we want to involve patients into the projects, always at the beginning or in the middle at the latest, because sometimes at the beginning of the process it is not necessary because it can be too technical, but we can never, never involve them at the end of the project, because sometimes we do a project, we, we complete it, we finalize it, and then we, are, we give the information to the patient. We need to avoid that. Involving the patient is very much enriching if we do it at the beginning, because we might discover things that we were not expecting, from needs to, to opinions. In the pharmaceutical industry, the patient is questioned f since the beginning because it, their opinion matters. always following a protocol, always taking into account quality issues. We have to assess, we have to choose the best association that we need to involve. Some patient associations sometimes call you. Um, we sometimes lack a protocol so as to choose 
what institution, what association we want to invite to collaborate with us. So we need a protocol uh, to enable us to choose the best patient association that we need for our research. We have to take into account, too, that when the patients get involved in this process, there are some barriers, personal barriers, individual barriers. Sometimes they, they don't see the benefit of their participation. Sometimes they just uh, ignore the code, or they think it's a waste of time, or um, they think they will have little influence on the final decision, or they don't assume the role in the decision-making process. So we need to provide them with skills, with uh, toolkits for them to feel empowered. Or, for example, we need to motivate them so that they can feel um, willing to take part in this decision-making process. We need to activate the citizens. I was talking earlier about the passive versus the active patients. Well, we need to activate them. We need to get them active. We did this um, classification for a review on, um, for a study about participation of patients in decision-making processes for health technology. We do a um, review of the literature and then we apply to our studies. Now I'm going to talk about the main difficulties of patients when appreciating the technology that is applied in health issues. Sometimes they have difficulties in understanding how the system works in Spain is more complicated because of the uh, 17 autonomous regions that we have, so we need to make them understand it. They also have difficulties in understanding how the technology works. There are some fields where patients are very much involved, some others where they are not sufficiently involved, so we have to go little by little and adapt to the changes that we are witnessing. Another thing that they say is that trust is uh, always on the doctor, deposited on the doctor. The, they, they have to trust the doctor because if the patient say no, for example, to a decision, but the doctor says yes, well, the trend is to always place the trust on the, on the doctor. They feel the, he's more, they are more um, empowered. Or, to, to, to express their opinions. So, uh, data-wise, it is much more uh, economically interesting if patients take part in this process. We need patients to realize the situation, we need to we need them to grab the situation, to, to get hold of it, and to feel integrated. We need them to then spread the word to the other fora, to other associations. We need them to spread the word, to disseminate the message. What are the basic needs to assess any type of information or innovation? Well, they have to be part of it, of course. They have to collaborate with the ministry in health strategies. Obviously the patient cannot take part in everything, but they do. They, they can take part in some of the meetings and some of the protocols, and so they need to really be invited to those, to those places. They need a minimum knowledge, so they need training. We, we should regard them as working colleagues. It's like when you are hired by a transnational company because you need to prepare for them a financial report. So your task is to draft a report and you need the input 
from the financial team, from the marketing team, from the technical team. Well, it's the same for a patient. They need to go there and receive input from many people. So with five or four hints from specific fields, he will have a clear picture, a broad picture of what's going on, and he will be able to voice um, the opinions of the rest of the patients. So these slides that you're seeing that have this uh, logo of the patient forum, the one that you can see um, top right, is because we presented them for the first time at the Spanish Patients Forum meeting. Uh, I still have two minutes. Well, these are the experiences of the Spanish Patients Forum. Sorry, there's a typo here. It's a mistake. It's not the European Forum, but the Spanish one. So this is something that we're doing little by little. Um, patients are really placed at the core of these activities. And these are the activities they are being invited to, for example, to take part in the drafting or of a guideline or a manual or, or surveys. I was talking to a girl another day. Um, she was really interested and she was really involved. She had a personal interest and a lot of time to devote to these issues. So what are the recommendations? We need different profiles of patients because different patients are suited for different purposes. So we need a specific patient profile, for example, for assessing a hepatitis um, drag. We need them to be proactive. They need to be clear and we need them to follow a structured methodology. For example, when it comes to choosing between one association or another, we can follow um, a protocol. So as to um, justify our decision. We need to train the participants, of course participants in general. And I'm going to skip the two last ones because I want to go to the conclusions. We need to include the patients in HDR from the beginning with um, some basic training. Of course, we don't want them to become pharmacists overnight, but we need them to have some basic knowledge so that they can take part in the discussions at uh, the top level. And we also need to be trained in how to interpret in a patient's opinion. So we need to have, we need to train the professional and that's all necessary as you have something to say. In Barcelona there is a hospital called San Juan de Deu, it's a pediatric hospital, it's a children's hospital, and they are now involving pediatric patients. They have even done some works in the hospital to adapt it to, to this. And for example, they invite the patients to talk about their opinions as to, for example, what color the one they was painted in or like small changes, but changes that they appreciate. So they've talked to the parents and to the children themselves, teenagers, small children, infants. And I think they have a very quite, a quite interesting experience if you want to hear about them sometime. To, to the floor if there is any question. not, I would uh, like to ask to Tamash, um, what do you think who should be or who is a good candidate for the UPATI training? And 
can you explain a little bit who is the best candidate for, for your um, services, for your trainings? So if you mean the, um, the expert training course, um, we have, um, because the selection process is going on right now, so I can, I can report on what, mm -hmm. what the criteria are, more or less. Um, we have, um, uh, for the um, about 50 places, we have um, 164 applications that we, that we receive now. And selection is done on the basis of um, disease areas, so areas where we don't have, we, where we haven't trained expert patients yet are given a preference so that we that we can that we can push push this knowledge and this know-how into other disease areas as well uh, also we are looking at uh, geographical di diversification mm -hmm. um, and and it's it comes with with a considerable time commitment so we we also look at whether potentially the person who applies will have the time to participate throughout the course because it's 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 a lot of learning it's a lot of study time that you have to that you have to invest so we look at that we look at that as well and then we discuss with the applicants whether they can actually fit this into their lives uh, most of the time they can but it's uh, but it's also um, uh, uh, an aspect. You don't have to be a member of any patient organization. You don't have to be a full-time patient advocate. I also don't think that there are many of those in, in, in Europe right now, so it's not it's not very common. So there are no, there, there's nothing really specific. Of course it's good if you have experience working in the field as a patient advocate, but you will also get the um, you will also get the practical advocacy training from us. So we also provide, if you like, political um, uh, uh, training about how to do advocacy in practice. So that's also not a requirement that you are a practicing uh, practicing advocate. But it's 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 a it's a, it's an advantage because that's that also makes it very much easier for us to convey the kind of the kind of knowledge that we that we want to convey. So that's that's basically. So it's new disease areas, I mean for us new disease areas, geographic diversification experience is what we what we are looking at. Thanks. Please Introduce yourself before. Thinking of children and teenager patients, who should stand up for them? Who should best, who could best represent them in the patients' organizations? I, well, I can I can give you an example from um, from the HIV field where we have. Um, we have um, a, a large program going on now, or a project going on now, which is called Aging with HIV, which uh, covers three uh, distinct age groups. And one of them is children and adolescents. So what we did was we actively reached out to children and their families living with HIV, so who were born with HIV or contracted HIV at a very young age. And we included them in the conferences. So. Um, we just we bring them to the conferences and we have special capacity building activities for them. So we try to explain to them in a language that they understand what what we what we want to know from them and what what we want to explain to them. So what does it mean to grow up with HIV? I will never know. I was I was 40 when I got HIV. So how should I know what it means to grow up or to be an adolescent with HIV? We have to ask them. So we ask them. That's and and I know that there are other organizations like the psoriasis organization in 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 Europe which does the same. They work specifically with uh, with young patients I know that EPF has a special training for young people living with various conditions, health conditions. So it is something that's being done. You, th this is a special. Maybe Valentina, you want to say something about that? Yes. Yes, 
In fact, as Tamas was saying, at EPF we have a youth group of young patients between 15 and 30, 29, 30 years old. On top of that, I would say that, I mean, there are already good ongoing good practices on involving young patients in medicine development. This is happening in uh, UK mainly. And uh, I mean, if you want, I can share with you some additional information of the contact people there. Uh, they have a lot of expertise in involving young patients in an appropriate way. Of course, it won't be the same way you involve adult patients. Uh, I would add the European Medicines Agency is also launching an initiative to involve young patients in their uh, trials. Uh, again, it's about finding the right way to involve them. It cannot be the same one as we do with other uh, patients. So there's a lot on going on and uh, we prefer young patients to be on board instead of being represented because they have a very specific views. And in my personal experience, because I'm the one coordinating the youth group, I can say there, there's a discrepancy between the views of the young patients and the, of the one of adults. They look much more at social aspects, access to education, not only healthcare, but of access to education and employment. And uh, more than adult patients, they want to be perceived as normal people, really. They have a big issue with the discrimination. So, but we can continue afterwards during lunch. <laughs> Hello, I have um, two questions, but before two short points. The first short point is to say hello to the translators. I was listening to your interventions and trying to put the cap. Normally are forgotten people and one second of say recognition. The second one is for the ones who don't know to remember the, the name Jovell, Albert Jovell, who was an important figure in the HTA field in late 90s, early 2000 in Spain as the deputy director of the Catalan Agency and was possibly the first one in Spain fully training in HTA at Harvard when he, at Harvard School of Public Health there was the Health Technology Assessment Group. I'm talking history, but important history. History which shall be known from the HCA community because time flows. You know him personally. You knew him personally. It was his, your boss or so, something like that, perhaps 15 years ago. And he was involved at some point in the spread of knowledge in a sensible way for professionals and, and patients. And he was the seminal person in getting the patients organized in Spain. That's the second comment I wanted to make. And the two questions are for both of you. The first one is how important are HTA issues in the broad definition of HTA in the general concerns of patient movement? Uh, the Chobet Institute and the Patient Forum has many issues to deal with. You mentioned uh, the children's hospitals of St. Holy Cross. Mm -hmm. They are among the list of the 10 more urgent issues. How big is HTA? Because my guess it will be it's important but not that important as patient concerns. The second question is much more polemic. It's, and it's a direct demand to all of you. Let's imagine someone who says beware of patient involvement because it's a Trojan horse of obscure interests. And that person elaborates, say, it's like asking you to go to a criminal court without a lawyer. Respond to that. Can you make the case that this risk is misplaced or it's a confusion or it's not a real risk? So two questions. The importance of HTA in their overall gamut spectrum of patient concerns. On the other one, this direct question. Thank you. Can I, can I start? Um, what do you want to say? No, yes. I don't know. It's um, now to your first question, and, and um, thank you for your comments. That's um, yeah. I, I used to be an interpreter, so yes. 
um, so to your to your um, to your first question it is um, it is a concern because everybody keep everybody keeps talking about HJ is coming up very strongly especially in the west of Europe while in the east and central and eastern Europe it's not it's not really high on the agenda so first of all we have to understand to what extent this is going to spill over to our region for example me coming from Hungary so it's very central Europe now drifting to the east um, so it is, it is an issue. We have a major problem in the whole patient community when it comes to pricing and affordability. And it, when, when you look at pricing and affordability, then of course HTA is very important. So we just cannot miss this aspect. Especially when I was, I was listening to, to all of these presentations, and I think it's high time for all of us to make a difference between price and value. Because oftentimes we keep hearing that new treatment, the value of new treatments is this and that. And you don't have access to hepatitis C treatment in large parts of Europe because of the value of the treatment. Well, it's not the value of the treatment. It's the price of the treatment that's too high. That's why you don't get access to hepatitis C treatment. So that's, so first of all, and then as soon as we start talking about pharmacoeconomics, it immediately becomes relevant for patient organizations. So what I can confirm is that there's a lot of work going on within uh, patient organizations to understand HTA better and to understand the various models used in HTA um, and, to st and, and, and to try to explore how we can make a meaningful involvement or, or input into these processes. So there's a lot of training going on. Um, I, I mean, I get, I get tons of invitations to all these trainings, webinars, discussions, uh, shared libraries, journal clubs, what not. All of that is about HTA, so it's, it's hot. Now, to the other thing, it's, uh, I, I think that I mean, my interpretation of your question is, are patient, patients or patient organizations bought by pharma? Are we pharma whores? Or not? That's basically that's a, that's a, that's a regular question, and this 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 debate is going on all the time. Also in the UK on the BMJ panel forum, where I'm I'm a member of the BMJ patient panel, and this is a very hot issue again. So we keep talking about this. Um, now I think that, and I will be equally polemic or philosophical if you like. I think that with the end of the welfare state, when the state spins off welfare functions to the families and to NGOs, then it's just not fair to say from the state or anyone else or any other stakeholder that patient organizations or civil society should not accept money for the work that the state is not doing and is pushing actively into patient organizations or the civil society. So yes, I'm happy to do it, but I cannot do it for free forever. So I will take money from industry, but I will take money on my terms. So receiving money from industry does not mean that I lose my mind. Receiving money from industry does not mean that I become a child or an infant. Receiving money from industry does not make me imbecile. Because this is, this is oftentimes the interpretation that by receiving money from industry, I immediately become a whore to industry money. That's not true. It's my decision. And it, there have been numerous examples in the HIV field when HIV organizations refused money from industry on ethical grounds. Abbott is a good example. Or I could, there, there are other companies, I'm sorry, I probably shouldn't name companies. So there, there have been examples for that when you say, when we said, no, you're not, you're playing a dirty game, we don't want your money. It, was it bad for us? It was very bad for us because we lost a huge chunk of our budget, whatever. So it's, it is, and that's why you need guidance documents. That's why you need the ethical guidance that you have to explain to patient organizations and other stakeholders as well how it can be done in, a, in an ethical way so that you don't prostitute yourself. And you don't. You don't need, you don't have to. Yes, it happens, but it doesn't have to happen. And it can be actively prevented. So, and how, how am I supposed to do this for years and years and years and years without getting paid? How? Why? <laughs> So, 
someone has to do it after all. Does that answer your question to some extent? Okay. Yo quería añadir muy muy rápido que bueno yo yo trabajo. I would like to say that I've worked as a as an advocate patient advocate in the industry and it's true that uh, there are some arrangements that are not very clean and the association accepts it because otherwise there would be no people that could uh, devote to the association if they have to mobilize defend their rights etc that's that would be complicated the ideal situation would be that there would be a lot of quality control a lot of transparency in everything that has been done why it has been done um, but it, i agree with tamash uh, it's not uh, when you receive some money you will not lose your uh, the north of your way i mean you will not lose your orientation let's say there is some important relevant question to to the speakers if not for the, during the lunch we can take the, have the time so thank you once again for your attendance and i remind you that now there is a, there will be a half an hour session